Next up here in Stillman at 5.30 uh, is Meg Shadle. The brief description about her, uh, arriving in Cleveland just for the happy hour after escaping from, from Bolivian nationalists who had kept, kidnapped her and a bass player named Susan who only knew two chords. Meg Shadle <laughs> became an expert on, this, on the supple pines of Northwest Tennessee. In 2002, she patented many explosive uses of CDs while working for Tiptoe Productions Limited, suffering a minor setback in 2005 when a rocket injured her prized cat. She now tours the country presenting on the dangers of alcohol-related repetitive stress injuries. Enjoy. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I collected some words from participants so that Jim could write that introduction. Anyway, um, I am going to quickly show my new toy that I got on Wednesday, but then I needed to mix a CD on Thursday, and then I left my house at 3 a.m., and then I drove to Akron, and then I drove here. So um, seriously, had this for one hour, and half of that it wasn't working. So anyway. Um, I am a cellist, and I do electronic music, and um, about two years ago, Keith McMillan approached me and said he was really interested in developing a wireless system for a bow. And um, basically, if some of you have seen some stuff that people have done before, they all have wires on them or a cage on your hand, and it's really terrible, and you're not playing anything real. Those of you that are familiar with cello bows might say that this frog's a little big, it's a little big, but it's the right weight. Um, it's really balanced well, and basically it's communicating with the computer over Bluetooth, and it charges via mini USB, and there's a little infrared emitter under the fingerboard that also comes off and on. So I could put this on an acoustic cello if I wanted, but basically I can put this under the plane and not worry, and my other cello, I freak out and have to buy the seat. So um, that's why I have this one. Uh, the other thing that I have that I'm not protected, I have a wireless little um, pickup on the cello. So I have wireless, wireless, wireless. All right, the bow. So under the fingerboard is um, this lovely little infrared emitter. And you guys can see maybe that little dude right there. So there's two emitters, one for the fingerboard and one for the bridge. So I actually sent them measurements of this cello, because I figured I'm going to tour with this more than the other one. and they fix it so it fits on the on the fingerboard under it and then these two emitters there's a receiver on the bow and if you watch the little um, these guys length and bridge if I'm length so tip and frog I get data and then bridge and fingerboard I get data and then tilt I think is which string I'm playing I haven't quite got that one right and then you kind of calibrate it. So if I decide that that's max and that's min, maybe on the tilt, a little better. No, not much better. Whoa, yeah, not bad. Oh, that's terrible. Anyway, um, <laughs> so basically what you can do, oh, and then there's another parameter, hair pressure. So no pressure. I don't know why that seems to be max. And when I put a lot of pressure on, it seems to be min, but that's the way it wants to work. So I'm letting it work that way. And then there's also a grip sensor in where you hold the bow. So that's one, two, three, four, five axes of control in the palm of my hand. But wait, there's more. Um, it also has a three axis accelerometer. <laughs> so um, if I had had time to program anything, it would be way cool. Instead, I have to use the presets. So basically, um, this can communicate using open sound control to any other kind of music application that uses open sound control. Open sound control is a kind of faster, deeper version of MIDI. So I could use this con to control Ableton Live. So if I had a synth pad that I was playing, I could control parameters on that synth pad. Um, right now, it only seems to be doing one thing at once. So here, as I push, it gets that wah going or not. So there's one with the hair. Another one that I found that I like is this grip distortion. So I'm like, and then I'm like, no, I'm going to be red. So I can just go from really quickly. stuff like 
with the reverb. Um, another really fun one that is up on YouTube, if you look, um, with my friend Mario doing it, is this movement delay thing. So. <laughs> So that's fun. Um, and that's as far as I've gotten with this. Do you guys have any questions about the cabo? <laughs> it's very neat. It's my new toy. I'm very excited about it. Sorry I couldn't get any deeper into the demo than that. But it's pretty rad. And um, I was in San Francisco, saw an open call for composers to come and write pieces for the trio metric, which was bass, guitar, and violin, and they had these giant racks of gear, and they kept saying they were going to condense it, and they were going to make these bows, and um, it's like two and a half years later, and I finally got my bow. Seriously, like on Wednesday, I'm like, my bow is coming, and everyone's like, don't you have it already? I was like, <laughs> So it's been two years that I've been really, really hoping and playing, and it's pretty much as cool as I thought it would be, except it won't fit in the bow case with my other bow, so it's like, that's kind of sad. But anyway. Um, yeah. Length panning. Let's see what that works. Just listen to the song. Going to keynote. So now I'm going to do my real talk. Hopefully, my phone is charged though. not do it with the phone. Okay, slide check. Everybody can see that, right? Am I supposed to be amplified or it just is going right into the camera? Oh, okay, I get it. All right, so um, this is my presentation that I gave to get my job, which despite my hilarious nature, I am a professor of music and digital art at uh, Stony Brook University in Long Island. Um, that's me, my friend Trinidad McAuliffe does painted bodies, so she painted me, and then some of that is real paint and some of it is digital art, and she actually studied with Charlie Woodman. 
who is sitting in the back who I'm going to be improving with later tonight. So one of the things that I like to think um, is that everything in the world has its own spirit, which can be released by setting it in motion. So I work a lot with music. So music is air molecules in motion. I work a lot with dance, people in motion. And um, I work a lot with projections or pixels in motion. Um, so my background, I'm a composer, cellist, programmer. I have a BA and an MM in computer music, and I'm actually done with the DMA in music composition, and I did cognates in electronic music and arts administration. I had a recital, which was um, a opera based on the Italo Calvino short story, A King Listens, which was premiered at the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center and was profiled by Apple.com. I was trying to get a free iPod from them, and they wrote an article on me instead, and I would highly recommend if anyone ever decides to give you free publicity or a free iPod, go for the free publicity. It lasts years. Um, uh, basically, I use Cycling 74's Max MSP Jitter Soft VNS Cyclops software to create interactive environments that I say I decorate with sound. So Max MSP Jitter is this graphical programming environment, and it was invented for musicians. You saw a really slick version of it in the software that was using for the bow. That was a really slick graphical interface laid on top of Max. It's essentially basically the manipulation of numbers, so you can transform one kind of data, such as sound, into a controlled data for another, like lighting or video, whatever you want. Um, I use it for audio tracking, video tracking. Also use sensors, so this is like sensors. Um, and artistic output. For a while, I worked there as the education coordinator, and um, I'm still teaching workshops for making things. So making things is a way to get sensors into Macs or into your computer, real-time, uh, real-world sensor data, and then you can control motors, robots, etc., lights with that hardware. So my research interests are the sustainability of electronic music and multimedia performance art. So I'm very into this stuff, but then it's 10 years later and you can't perform your thing anymore because it was for OS 9 and it, your computer that ran OS 9 just died and you're crying. So um, I'm very interested in kind of notation as a way to ensure sustainability. I'm interested in the early experimentalists, so um, Henry Cowell, Joanna Byer, John Cage, uh, interactive systems. So you saw a really kind of rudimentary example of, woo, it's interacting with me. But imagine if the grip, the bow, where it was, if all of those things were contributing to the sound profile. That's what I'm mostly interested in. Psychoacoustics. So how do we hear what we're hearing? Why do we hear some things differently than it looks like we should? And I'm um, proud to say that I am a feminist. So. <laughs> Uh, service interests, so I like writing music, but I also get a kick out of producing other people's works. Um, I really find that a performance is something magical, and a lot of people do concerts, and the person gets up there and like taps on the microphone, is like, is this on? Oh, wait, uh, and I really am more interested in having people come up, just play, and it's gorgeous. Um, Along with Tim, I am involved with the New West Electro, we just changed it, Electronic Arts and Music Organization. I'm involved with the International Computer Music Association, the Women's Audio Mission, the Beam Foundation. They're the people that made, well, okay, so Keith McMillan invented the Zeta cello and violin. It was on the cover of Playboy. He's all very proud of that. Made millions and then disappeared for a while to make this. So um, that's the Beam Foundation and pretty much every bow that is bought, he donates half the proceeds to this Beam Foundation, which is made to um, ensure the performance of electronic music. So that's pretty cool. And I'm also on the editorial board of Organized Sound, which is a peer review publication out of Cambridge. Um, so my major influences probably are some people you haven't heard of other than Tim. Well, Tim is not an influence. Tim has heard of them. Um, Edgar Varez for his timbre and form. Morton Feldman for his sparse structures. Pauline Oliveros, she has this focused attention that I really like. I have an interest in sound for its own sake. So the fact that I can like manipulate sound using this bow, using like something that I've trained 30 odd years on and can get in there and really shape and sculpt the sound is fascinating to me. And I do believe that the form is the outward expression of inner meeting, which is something that Kandinsky once said. So today, if we have time, I will talk about five kind of compositions, um, approaching each from a formal, collaborative, and technological perspective. So the first thing is Cassini Division. So this is bowed piano, cello, violin, percussion, and they're interacting with the video, which isn't that obvious in this movie, but really, they are.
So that's what I was talking about, like just kind of this big sound mass that's sort of sitting there. Um, so that was a piece written for Nextons, which was founded by Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music Students in October of 2003. So the ensemble was flute, violin, cello, piano, and percussion. We were dedicated to performing new works of interactive acoustic and computer music. And over the course of four years, we commissioned almost 20 works and performed at over 30 festivals. I actually began as the cellist, and then we realized we needed a dedicated performance technologist, and I remembered that I had tendonitis and couldn't play really hard stuff without making my arm go wah! So, um, I kind of stopped being the cellist and became just the performance technologist. I left Cincinnati and then would come back just for the gigs. But basically, if Nextons was there, I was there. I was just as important as any other member. Um, so one of these uh, electronic music guys is Luigi Nono, and he had an assistant who was Borio, and he said there's no longer a principal performer, but each member of the team, including the technicians, forms part of a larger reciprocally adding mosaic acting mosaic of members, there is sort of a static virtuosity calling for concentration, control of the most subtle oscillations in sound, and the ability to interact with the other ensemble participants. A work, thus, is no longer the product of a solitary composer, but the result of a continuous exchange of ideas within the triangle of composer, performer, technician. And I truly believe that, and I add kind of other artists or engineers, like it's not just a triangle, it's a multi-sided polygon. Um, so that Cassini division piece was commissioned by Nextons, and I actually created it to work in the larger context of a program full of really virtuosic noty pieces, so it was supposed to give them a chance to kind of engage a different part of their brain. So I collaborated with each player to develop a sound profile. So the violinist would play just on the G string, we muted it really hardcore, and he would just, he played really lightly. The cellist loved distortion, so we created this fuzzy distortion, which basically became more pronounced as the volume increased. If she had had a bow, it could have been as her grip increased. Um, the percussionist would do a nice crossfade between a tremolo on the vibraphone and the marimba. And so it would basically go from something that had no vibrato to something that had vibrato and back. It was kind of nice. And the piano had an ebo, which is this um, thing for guitarists. It's this little magnetic resonator that can make it just go wah instead of being plucked. Um, and they were bowing it with rosined fishing line. At the end of it, they could like hold the fishing line tight and pluck it, and it would sound like it was um, pizzicato. And in the very end, they, would, they broke it, which made the piano technicians wince, and it was great. <laughs> Uh, so Cassini Division is based on the G harmonic series. Do you guys know about the harmonic series? Octave fifth, octave fourth, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's inspired by the gravitational harmonic pulls. So basically, the rings around Saturn are created because of the gravitational pulls of its moon. So basically, each of these players was like a moon, and they were exerting gravitational pull on the sound. So each of the instruments uses a ring modulation to modulate the other. And then each player also controls a different parameter of the video. Mm -hmm. And in the program notes, when I'm talking all fancy-like, I say that it creates a vibrating crystalline structure, which is heard from many angles. <laughs> 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 when I did my job talk, I did not say that sarcastically. I said it very seriously and deeply. Uh, so anyway, uh, the notation is inspired by Feldman. I talked about him before as an influence. So I played a piece at University of Buffalo called Between Categories. So it's basically two identical ensembles playing independently with occasional sync points. So there was one conductor, and they would be like, get ready. We're at a sync point. Boom. But the rest of the time, you kind of floated. And it was really interesting to play because the relationships between the two ensembles were constantly changing. So basically. In Cassini Division, each player sees one other player's staff. And the instrumentation of that second staff changes throughout the piece. So at one point, you're listening to the pianist if you're the cellist. And then you have to listen to the violinist. And then you have to listen to the percussionist. And this creates a focused listening, like I was talking about with Pauline Oliveros. So the players must situate events in time based on the other's performance. So the pianist is waiting for the cellist to do something. The cellist knows that they're cueing the percussionist to do something. And it just creates this really kind of floaty good thing. Um, basically, minute changes in pitch create large effects in the audio. This is a result of that ring modulation. And I exploited that using that steady pitch, steady pitch of the marimba versus the vibraphones, and also explicitly notating the vibrato in the violin. So each player is mic'd individually, like I am right now. And the levels are basically set in relationship to the bowed piano. There's no real dynamic control for bowed piano. I found that out, and I was kind of sad. Um, and using MSP, that program that I was talking about, the pitch of each instrument is tracked. And then that controls the frequency of a sine wave, which is used as a modulator wave for another instrument. If you were at all into computer music, you'd be like, wow, that's cool. Um, and this basically. 
Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Froggy. Um, and then here I go with that like fancy word again, this harmonically rich interplay between the instruments. So the video, which you can't see, but if you remember, it was up there, um, was source footage taken from this um, drawing on permanent marker on undeveloped film created one by one of my often time collaborator, Nick Fox Geeg. You will hear his name mentioned throughout this presentation. So um, basically, it was this kind of 10 second video. And I used it when I was learning David Rokeby's soft VNS object and discovered that it created really gorgeous imagery when I was using the VNS lens. So I took those eight seconds, which were basically frame by frame animation, and played it through really slowly. So made a 12 minute piece out of it and put some transitions between the frames. And so the volume of each instrument would control individual parameters of the lens effect, such as the position of the lens, the focal length, and the curvature. So it would just be kind of morphing in space. So you can kind of see it. And that's the pianist breaking. Do you have any questions about anything that I've said so far? Breaking what? Breaking, breaking the fishing twine. Not the strings of the piano, but the oh. twine, it's the, the fishing wire. Yeah, it just no. Yeah. yeah. Nobody died. Nobody died. Well, it was, I mean, I just about killed Xiao Wen one performance because she like it's um fishing twine tied onto popsicle sticks and she dropped the popsicle sticks. So it was like tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and the pedals down on the piano so it like yeah, resonates and like the whole thing has been in the key of G but you have the pedal down so it's like all the notes and I was like <laughs> luckily it sounded like an accident and people forgave it. Um, so Cassini Division was a relatively easy collaboration. It was players I'd actually performed with and saw on a regular basis. I knew their skills and interests were in the same field, so we had the same vocabulary and reference points, and Nick Foxkey gave me full permission to use his little eight seconds of video and transform it however I wanted, which is really great. Um, I'm now going to talk about some of the stuff that I do with dance, so Fleshlight Movement. Um, I'd worked with dance, and I'd actually worked with this dancer before, and I was based in San Francisco, she's in LA. We met for like four days to map out the structure and behavior of the piece. We sent work back and forth over the internet and met a day before the performance to really like hash it out. So working with dance sucks because um, we have divergent vocabulary and reference points. So I'll be talking about tempo and she'll be talking about tempo and for some reason she doesn't mean the speed of things. I really don't understand what she means by tempo because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so talking about music and dance was kind of hard even though I've taken a bunch of years of dance and she'd taken a bunch of years of music. We were just like, so we just sort of decided to trust each other. Um, and talking about the video was a lot easier because we had the same vocabulary for that. But luckily, we have the same interest and artistic goals. And I think in collaboration, especially with someone from another field, it's really important to respect the other person's expertise. So they might be pushing boundaries that you know nothing about. So this is um, how flashlight movement works. So the dancer casts a shadow onto a screen. And then there's a camera behind that screen. And then it's going through the computer, feeding the projector, and then projecting a manipulated image onto a second screen. Um, it's inspired by memory, how events are repeated, shaped, manipulated over time. And we basically, here's that like serious thing again. We use metaphors of light and dark because they are all powerful, encompassing truth, revelation, discovery, memory, and consciousness. Don't I sound deep? Um, and then uh, another thing is that the, there's basically like these three planes of movement. So there's the dancer and the dancer's shadow and then the manipulated shadow. So it's really, um, I think one of our more successful pieces just because there's so much visually happening but it's all sort of related, which is nice. And the choreography generates specific responses from the environment and this creates a play between light and its absence. So basically I was tracking the ratio of light to dark in different areas of screen and then the motion of the dancer would control audio processing. So with interactive stuff I like to have a one-to-one -one correspondence 
So like when I was shaking the bow, that's something that everybody's like, oh, she's shaking the bow and it's doing something. And like, maybe you don't see that I'm turning the grip and doing the distortion. You hear that effect, but you don't actually see it. So that one-to-one -one thing makes you really understand that I am controlling stuff and that maybe I'm controlling more stuff and you're just not deep enough to get it. No. Um, so other checking elements were more subtle. So basically she was controlling the relative volume of six pre-recorded tracks, controlling harmonization, distortion, and filtering on those. And basically she was morphing between presets. So this is, there were these six tracks and if she could have made herself into a square and like just been in fear, she would have just heard fear. But she can't because she's a dancer and she's not a cube. So like the amount of shadow in each of these would like, so this would be, if you were all in preset one, you'd be covering fear completely. Preset two was excitement covered completely. But because you had these six and you could actually get in all six, it was morphing between six kind of presets, but each of those presets had like 40 different variables, so it's not as easy as it sounds. And then these little um, boxes up here are the bells. So if she reached up, I'm going to reach down. Hello. Ooh. Basically, she could, if she was covering more than 50% of one of those boxes, it would trigger bells, and they were lower on that end and higher on that end. Um, and we did it as an installation, too, so people would like, woo, I'm ringing bells. Super fun. Um, this is Max, so this is the ugly, dark underbelly of Max. You saw the pretty graphical overview. Um, so basically, these are little objects. So this would be the thing from the camera. These would be those six boxes I was talking about, right? And then those are the 12 on the top. So this is like scissors and columns. It breaks it up into little bits that you can then do stuff with. And then this number basically would tell you how much light and darkness was in there, and then this like greater than 520 was saying if more than half that box was covered, it would send a message saying do something. This is what I was talking about with that um, preset. So this is one, that's two, that's four, and then you can get an average of one and two. So if you were 50% in one and 50% in two, that's what it would look like. But you could also have one and two and a lot of four. So it's not just a um, kind of linear transformation. It has six dimensions. Uh, so this is flashlight movement. do that on the not system. So then you see her movement appearing. In this version, the bells were a little crooked, so they were like harder to ring over there and really easy to ring over there. It's kind of funny. Anyway, that's uh, flashlight movement. And then the video, you might have figured it out. It was really, really simple. Basically, the video was looking at the middle third of the screen only, and then creating six columns from clear to low contrast with a varied delay. So the first one was three, six, nine, and then 13, 18, 24, so kind of an exponential thing going there. Um, and that's how that delay works. So notice, if you can read it at all, that's jit.scissors. So it's receiving the movie from the camera, doing a scissors, and just looking at the middle column, and then spitting that out into, um, then I glued them back together after I delayed them. So do you have questions about that thing? Thanks, that was fun. And then the airline lost our screen, and then it became less fun. <laughs> So um, this is an example of something that I like to call a performance site because install, what install formances sounded kind of dirty. So um, 
basically these function as both installations and performance spaces, performance installations and performance pieces. The audience is basically encouraged to interact with the system so they can understand a understand the concepts and techniques driving the work. They become co-creators and co-performers in this multi-sensory experience, and then they can fully appreciate the virtuosity of the performance. So basically, you go to hear a piano recital and you're not trying to figure out how the piano works. You're like, wow, that was great. Um, and a lot of times in these interactive music performances, I'm sitting there going, what are they doing? Is they remote controlling stuff? Like there's a chick that performs with like a microphone stand that has sensors in it, and like, you're always just kind of being like, how does it work? What are they doing? Why is it doing that? And then you never quite get to the artistry. And I'm really trying hard to turn off that part of my brain at these conferences and just kind of approach the work. Like, it doesn't matter what technology you're using. Like, I was using video delays and made something cool. And like, video artists might be like, oh my god, you only use delay. Well, Charlie wouldn't, because he's cool like that. But um, basically. Um, this is a chance for somebody to like, play around with it, see that it's really working. So, oh my gosh, it's not just perfectly timed. The performer isn't just like a monkey in a suit. Um, they are really doing it. And then they get a chance to understand, oh, you reach up, you ring bells, cool. Um, and then when they see the performance, they're like, whoa, she rang a bell with her foot. I didn't think of that. So that's the basic idea of that. Um, the next piece I'm going to talk about is also a performance site. It's called Les Soeurs de Malas. And um, basically, there was a pianist at the school where I went for my doctorate. And his name was Jacob Broderbeck. And now he's at the school where I teach, which is kind of fun. But anyway, he commissioned the composers at CCM to create pieces inspired by Alice in Wonderland. So I wanted to create this interactive story, which could be read by audience members or sonified it's one of those words, with a prepared piano. So basically, I use the rhythms of the words in the story to create a piano part. So this is a technique that Harry Parch, who was kind of a poet, composer, tramp dude, would use to write music. He would read his poetry and then transcribe the rhythm. Um, and I chose the story that the Dormouse tells um, Alice at the Mad Hatter's tea party. Uh, so basically, I created motives for the characters and words in the piano. So Alice was thumbtacks and the hammer, so that created really bright sound. Um, the Dormouse, I tuned an octave and a half to the same note. So some of it was really too bright, um, and some of it was really flaccid. So that was the Dormouse. Um, treacle became the screws on harmonics of notes a half step apart, so it kind of went treacle. Um, the well, the strings were just completely loosened, which made kind of a percussive effect. And for when they were drawing, I put paper clips on the strings and then would move them up and down. And it kind of sounded like you were writing. And you would step through the narrative by pushing a MIDI pedal. Had I had the bow, you know, you could have got, I love this bow. <laughs> you could have like just gone, boo, next thing. But I don't know why you'd have a bow unless you were like bowing your piano. Anyway, um, I worked with Nick again on this um, to create the video, which is basically in three parts. So there's these thought bubbles up ahead, which play in sequence. And then there's short clips of Alice and the Dormouse. Like they're basically opening their mouths, and they're controlled by the volume and pitch of the audio input. Volume is mapped to the frame number of the movie. So it gives the appearance of like that the characters are talking. Have you guys seen the iPhone app with the mouth? And you can like hold it here, and the mouth will go, I'm talking to you. Basically, same concept, but with video. Well, that's with video, too. So that's the video of the Dormouse. So it was you know, 20 frames long. And then I would say, this is quiet, and that's loud, the, just like I was doing with the bow. So calibrating it. And then each movie was a different length. So you could have either more control or less control over them opening and shutting their mouths. So although I'm trained as a musician, I think that I have a highly developed visual sense. And I worked closely with Nick to develop the look of Alice and the Dormouse. And for me, humor was a really important aspect. Um, but I gave him complete freedom for those thought bubbles where the story played out. And I think that distinct roles are important for good collaboration. In this case, I was the kind of the artistic director. And in other projects, Nick has been the leader. So that was Alice. Um, at her most cracked out, I felt like all the other people were doing like, oh, Alice, she's so cute. And in that story, she gets like really mad and like stomps her feet and is generally a bitch. So I felt it was very important that she be really tweaky and look like the guy, um, remember um, Daria, the, the teacher that would get the bloodshot eye that would stick out? That was kind of the inspiration for Alice. <laughs> So she had this overbite, and she was really ugly, and it was awesome. Oh, do you have any questions? I get so caught up in the beautiful Alice. No, no questions. 
Okay. So, uh, let's start with last. The form was rigorously narrative. There's not much variation between performance. The video simply responds to the performer. There's no loop of interaction, which is what I really like to get going. But there was a careful consideration of the balance between the elements. At times, the music was the most important thing. and others, the video was the most important. So there was this extended narrative of the Dormouse talking about all the things that they drew that begin with J. And so Nick really took off, and I just had the pianist moving a sponge up and down the strings while that whole video was playing. Um, so video savant is the thing that Charlie created. And in here, again, there's that careful consideration of the balance between out elements, but with the added challenge of improvisation and open form. So I programmed this mixer for Charlie Woodman to create an instrument he could use to perform with musicians. Um, we had an unsuccessful performance in Chicago with uh, performers who were really not able listeners, and it kind of sucked. So um, I'd just like to say that improvisation requires practice and discipline. It's almost real-time composition. Um, Pauline Oliveros says there's conservatories so that there should be improvisatories, and I think that that's true. Um, we are doing this tonight with some people who have improvised before, but not with us. So. In this case, Charlie was the artistic director. Um, and this performance, we had an hour long with video, drum set, DJ, guitar with effects boxes, and Zeta Cello, this thing, played through Max MSP. We basically had three rehearsals with Y. So it was me, Charlie, and this band who played together. We figured out a basic sound and familiarized ourselves with the videos that he was going to use. So as I said, group improvisation is real-time collaboration and composition. And Roger Reynolds is this composer that won a Pulitzer Prize and is super important, blah, blah, blah. Um, so he said that the unknown has always been the most inviting aspect of the compositional process. So in improv, it's really all about the unknown, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so I played cello and the process sounds through the spherical speaker array, which was developed by Dan Truman and Curtis Bond. So my friend Michael Zbizbinski made it for me out of $50 worth of parts in exchange for an old cell phone that didn't work on my network. Um, so I say use your network, that was because my network didn't work anymore, so I gave him the phone and he made me a speaker that was usually like $500, so I got off easy. And basically this thing radiates sound in all direction, which imitates acoustic sound propagation. So if I turn around, I'm actually still spitting sound out the back of my head, um, and speakers are just doing it one way. And so um, the first time I ever heard Dan play, he was playing electric violin, and I knew he was playing electric, I knew he played electric violin, and I was down the hall, and I heard this thing, and I was like, I thought Dan played electric violin. And I walked in, and he was playing a solid body electric violin, and I was just like, what? So um, it's not really the timbre of these things that gives yourself away. It's more about the way the sound radiates out of the speakers. Um, so they took the impulse response curves, basically they put a cello in a cage of 12 microphones and banged on the bridge and saw how the frequencies changed in the various microphones and then used that as a convolution, so basically multiplication in the audio domain. And then you basically get that to the signal coming from the, so you multiply this signal, one channel, by those eight frequency response curves or 12, I think they even did one with 20, um, and then you get like what it sounds like to be playing that instrument. So that's the gorgeous um, speaker. And this is my gratuitous PowerPoint moment, which was that he made them out of IKEA salad bowls. <laughs> um, when I moved to Long Island, he, he borrowed them. And then I moved to Long Island, and I haven't gotten them back. But I got some money from Stony Brook and actually bought a hemispherical speaker that's a little bit bigger. So, But for a while, yes, I had IKEA salad bowls hanging from a carabiner. So this is um, some of Charlie's video, and the Y and me. And that's Charlie, right there. And right there. This is very exciting.
go till 6 30. okay now you see why i'm not a video editor <laughs> so that's the band um we had a really great moment where there was one of the video clips was it from 2001 with the bone and the apes or was it just a bone and ape video yeah, so there was a video with, um, from 2001 with the apes and the bones. Um, and we all really thought the percussionist should just take over at that point. And he was like, no, don't leave me hanging. That's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And Charlie picked up that video. And we just the rest of us looked at each other and just smiled and dropped out. And the percussionist was sitting there playing and glaring at us. So it was pretty great. Charlie, do you have anything you want to say about Video Savant? OK. Come see it tonight. Come see it tonight. Uh, so, uh, that we played with that band Y, so then I thought that this would be like a good opportunity to put in Y Collaborate, because I'm punny like that. Um, so I would like to create these interactive, um, expressive, immersive environment, and they're pretty much beyond the scope of what I can create myself. I cannot be an expert in all the art forms I'm interested in, and I really think that the process of collaboration in itself is a kind of art. Uh, it allows you the intimate privilege of knowing someone else's art and artistic process, and I think you form really deep connections with other people. You're really, you're forced to trust someone else with your art and like that's what I spend all day doing and then to be like here um, it really um, teaches you about the world and about how to interact with it and people and share and all that good stuff and trustworthiness and how to be careful with other people's stuff and I've pissed people off before so it can happen um, so I have 10 more minutes and I'm gonna rush through this because this is uh, the color of waiting basically that screen that I was talking about um, that the airlines lost we were in doing a European tour and we were supposed to be touring that piece and it kind of depends on having that screen. So uh, we had a little residency at Stime in Amsterdam, which is a really cool place for kind of electronic art. They put you, if you can get there, they put you up for free in the heart of Amsterdam. Um, and you have a kitchen, so you just buy your food and work. And then they give you like little helper people that come by about once a day. And they're like, are you stuck? Do you need help? And they help you. It's like magic. Um, so the color of waiting combines animation, movement, music, and video. Um, and it's basically separated into five sections dealing with anticipation. So Allison and I were in Amsterdam. We were supposed to be making a new piece that was going to be performed way later. And um, we were like, oh shit, we better come up with a piece that we can perform now. Uh, so we were waiting for the screen, and we're like, what else can you wait for? You can wait for love, you can wait for inspiration, you can wait for agreement, you can wait for something you need or a necessity, and you can wait for the end. So we kind of were like, all right, we're going to make a piece. It has these five sections. Um, and then we were like in Amsterdam, and all these people had these bike lights, and we were intrigued by the bike lights, and then we were going to track the lights, but then it didn't work, but then I had the cello, and Allison was like, I'm sick of controlling everything. You get to control something. Let's use the cello to control stuff, but I want it to still look like I'm controlling stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We basically came up with it all together. There's five sound files in the piece that all kind of have to do with water. And basically, they all come in together, and then they get stripped off until you have the one final sound. Um, there's one of the sounds. So that's processed uh, rain falling on a skylight in the um, apartment where we were. Uh, the cello part was set in deliberate opposition to those electronic sounds, so I had long held notes, tube and inspired harmonics, this revolving and repeating melody evoking the work of Somme Sato, and it's kind of centered on D. And then in the final section, I started playing uh, Colenio, which was actually with the bow on the string instead of the hair, and that sort of sounds like rain, right? A little bit. So then finally in the last section, which was the waiting for the end, it all sort of came together, and you're like, oh, okay. So the cello controls the video. Um, I control the height of the waves with the volume and the timbre, um, and I basically watch the dancer. So as she goes down, I play louder, and it makes the water go down, and as I'm softer, the water goes up, and um, the noisiness in the signal controls how quickly it kind of returns back to normal. I had it just working, and then it became really kind of mechanical, because every time I stopped playing, it would just kind of go whoop. So I put this other thing looking at the timbre of what I was playing in order to control how quickly it would go back up. And it became, to use an over word, use the word organic. Um, and then there's a part where there's an eye. And I actually control the direction that the eye looks through pitch tracking. So it's, again, like that 
little mouth thing, except here the pitch controlled whether it's left or right. It was uh, open D to the D2 octaves above. And basically, I watched the dancer's gaze or her lights or her body. And it was pretty great. We went to a conference in Geneva, uh, Genoa. It's the new interfaces for musical expression. And um, these kids have seen it all. And they were like, how did you get it to do that? That was so awesome. And I was like, did it with the cello. They were like, no. Because basically, our eyes are our primary source of input. We get about 90% of our information. So they, no one even guessed that it was the cello doing it. Because I was watching the dancer. She was improvising. I was doing it. And it was so well done that we really fooled everybody. It was kind of great. So more Max stuff. Um, basically, they're all separate videos that can get blended onto a video plane in OpenGL. They're composited it onto this one image with three columns. Um, and then we had a set with vertical blinds. So this was a box for the dancers. So she starts off really still, because we had no idea whether we would have any kind of dance surfaces. And um, then I had a box for me, projector, and then blinds. And um, basically, the blinds were open a little bit. And they also conveyed that metaphor for waiting, like looking out the window, but added this texture and dimensionality to the um, video. And then the, each of the videos, the waves and the eye, could be moved horizontally and vertically and um, grown and shrunk. So basically, the video fits perfectly on each of those blinds. And when it works, it's great. And when you only have 10 minutes to set up, it's a nightmare. Um, <laughs> told you about the wave control. Told you about the eye control. So this is the waves. And most of the time, it's actually just looking at those. Um, three pieces of the video. But then um, I also wanted to add some horizontal movement. So at one point, um, the video starts scanning horizontally over the movie. So this lateral motion contrasts with those rising and falling waves that we've been seeing. So the parameters change randomly, but the middle one always has to be between the outside ones. So you can kind of see, hey, I lost that slide. Oh, well. Um, anyway. The piece is improvised. It can last between 9 and 13 minutes, but the timings of the transitions are set. The audience is basically held in stasis. Every element of the piece is linked to the others through multiple methodologies, creating a work which is beyond multimedia. Wouldn't you want to give me a grant if you read that sentence? <laughs> um, and ideally, the piece works on an artistic level, even if you don't really kind of understand the relationships. But this is what like Allison and I think about. So we're like, oh, the cellist is kind of the dance. The cellist watches the dancer to improvise music. We wear identical costumes. The eyes in the video are related to the lights at the cost that the dancer hold. Um, and, it, and she anticipates the scanning movement of the eyes. Um, and then in the section four, the, the projected eyes follow these lights. The music is the video. The sound is made up of recordings of water. And the video is of waves. And the sound of the cello controls the video. The set is related to the costumes, because the horizontal types in our costumes echo the slats and the blinds. And the computer is the structure, because it uses it to advance through the five sections. We like to say that music begins to atrophy when it departs too far from the dance. Poetry begins to atrophy when it gets too far from the music. I mean, we could just keep going on and on again. Video becomes begins to atrophy as it gets too far away from my bow. <laughs> so this is a performance in da Boulder. I think Tim was there. be able to tell that I completely faked the sound. Because if you watch me, I'm not doing what I have to do. <laughs> Um, so that's the dance stuff is with a project company that I call Kinesthetic Sense. And we collaborate with lots of people. And we use the computer as a place of neutrality where all art forms can be the same. We like to include glitch, which is the inclusion of chance. And we have symbiotic relationships between elements. We have multiple techniques, which create multiple interpretations. We try to engage all the senses. We defeat the boundaries between dance, music, video, set, and drama. And we reinterpret the mediums being utilized. Um, we incorporate technology with art, not as a spectacle to impress, but rather, rather as a way to clarify and advance current art forms. Are there any questions? 6.30, yes! <laughs> 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 oh, 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, final side. Oh, yeah, we should totally play that one. But I ran out of time, so I can't, I can't read it. It's against the rules. <laughs>